Okay, so we're going to start with inverse functions, and so we're going to talk about one-to-one -one functions, inverse functions, equations of inverses, and application of inverse functions to cryptography. So cryptography is the study of codes, code breaking, and things like that. So what is a one-to-one -one function? Okay, so we we know what a function is. So a one-to-one -one function can be formed um, by flipping the ordered pairs of a uh, function. But not all functions um, are one-to-one -one functions. <clears throat> okay, so if you get this function here, right? So we have a function, negative uh, 2, 2, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 3, 2, 5, okay? If we can, if we switch all of the ordered pairs, in other words, we flip the x and y's, then we get another function, in this case, g. Okay, and notice that this represents a function, okay, because every y value, or excuse me, every x value goes to one and only one particular y value. Okay, so g is an inverse function, or excuse me, f is a one-to-one -one function. If we can take f and we can flip the x and the y and we get another function, then we say that f is one-to-one. -one. Okay. Now that doesn't happen all the time. Now, to show that these two sets are related, g is called the inverse of f. For a function f to have an inverse, f must be one to one, be a one-to-one -one function. So they're directly related to each other. So if a function is one-to-one, -one, then it must have an inverse. Okay. If you can find an inverse to a function, then that also shows that it is one-to-one. -one. So in this case, in a one-to-one -one function, each x value corresponds to one and only one y value. And each y value corresponds to only one x value. So it goes both directions. Okay. Now, if you look at this function, this is not a one-to-one -one function. Even though it's a function, right? So it's okay for 2 to go to 7 and 3 to go to 7. But it's not a one-to-one -one function because these two numbers go to the same number. Okay, remember, every y value, if it's to be one-to-one, one one, every y value can only have one uh, x value. So if you flip this around and go the other direction, it's not a function. Okay, so if every x value only has one y value and every y value only has one x value, then it's going to be a one-to-one -one function. So this is an example of a one-to-one -one function. So every number in the domain maps only to one element in the range. And only one element in the range has exactly one element in the domain. So now a function, here's the definition, a function f is a one-to-one -one function if, for elements a and b in the domain of f, a equals b implies that f of a does not equal f of b. Okay, so that is different values in the domain, different values in the domain will correspond to different values in the range. Okay, that's a one-to-one -one function by definition. Now, using the concept of the contrapositive from uh, the study of logic, okay, the last line in the preceding box is equivalent to this. So if we say not this implies not this, so that means if A is not equal to B, 
implies that f of a is not equal to f of b, then it stands that f of a equal to f of b should also imply that a must equal b. And we use this statement to decide whether a function is one to one in the next example. So this, if this is true, right, if f of a equal f of b, that if the, and it implies that a is equal to b, if that's true for all a and b, then it's a one-to-one -one function. So let's look at this. So we want to decide whether this function is one-to-one. -one. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say that take two x values, right? We're going to say, okay, if x1 equals x2, what does that show us if this is true? So let's find a and b. So we must show that a f of a equals f of b leads to a equals b. Okay, so let's let's prove that. So let's start with the given, right? Let's start with the, we're going to assume that f of a equals f of b. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to solve the equation. So we're going to plug in a here, so we get negative 4a plus 12 equals negative 4b plus 12. Okay. Well, it's it's obvious that the 12s are going to cancel, and then we divide by negative 4, the negative 4s are going to cancel, right? And we get a equals b, and therefore it is a one-to-one -one function. Now, let's decide whether this one is a one-to-one -one function. So we're going to do the same thing. Let's do f, let's assume f of a equals f of b for two two uh, two di distinct numbers a and b. Okay. So if we choose a equals three and a, a b equals negative three, then three cannot equal negative three. Right. But, look at this, f of 3 equals 4. Right? And f of negative 3 also equals 4. So what does that mean? Well, we've got f of a and f of b are equal to each other, but a and b are obviously not the same. So here, even though we've got a specific example where f of three equals f of or f of three equals f of negative three equals four, even though these are different, by definition, f is not a one-to-one -one function. Right, because remember, to be at one of them function, it must hold for all values. So if f of a is equal to f of b, we have to show that for any a and b, that if f of a and f of b are equal to each other, then a must be equal to b. Okay, and so here we found a counterexample of where it doesn't hold. Now, as an illustrated as illustrated in example 1b, a way to show that a function is not one-to-one -one is to produce a pair of different domain elements that lead to the same function value. There is a useful graphical test called the horizontal line test. So just like we had the vertical line test to show that a function was a well-defined function, right, so that we had had a function to begin with. The horizontal line test is a test that we use to see if the inverse function is a function, or in other words, to test whether a function is one-to-one. -one. And this will tell us whether an inverse exists. Okay. And the vertical line test works exactly the same, or excuse me, the horizontal line test works exactly the same way as the uh, vertical line test. So the horizontal line test, uh, a function is one-to-one -one if every horizontal line intersects the graph 
of the function at, at, at most one point. Okay, so at most one. So it in, intersects the graph at most once. So now, in example 1b, the graph of the function is a semicircle, as shown in the figure as here. So here's our semicircle, right? So since you know it's a semicircle, the horizontal line is going to intersect that top hemicircle uh, in more than one point. So it can't, by the horizontal line test, it's not one to one either. Now, determine whether the, each graph is the graph of a one to one function. And so in this case here, it is not, because if you draw a horizontal line test, you can definitely intersect at more than one point. Okay, so this is not one to one. What about this one? Well, if we draw a horizontal line anywhere, anywhere on this, you're not going to intersect at in any more, any more than one, right? So at most one intersection. So in this case here, this would be one to one. Now notice that the function graphed in this example here decreases on its entire domain. So in general, a function that is either increasing or decreasing on its entire domain, such as negative x or x cubed and the square root of x must be one to one. So that means if it's always increasing or if it's always decreasing on its domain, then it must be a one to one function. So now here's testing to determine whether function a function is one to one. One show that f of a equals f of b has to lead to or in, does lead to a equals b okay then that means that the function has to be one to one uh, then step in step two or uh, option two is in a one to one function every y value corresponds to no more than one x value so every value in the range can only have or map to one value in the domain. And to show that a function is not one to one, uh, find at least two example two x values that produce that produce the same y value. And that will do it. And then three sketch the graph and use the horizontal line test. Four, if the function either increases or decreases increases on the entire domain, then it is one to one as well. Okay, so let's consider these two functions. Okay. So let us choose an arbitrary element from the domain of f, say 10. Let's evaluate f of 10. So f of 10 will give us 85. Okay. And then let's now evaluate g of 85. Okay. And what do we get when we do g of 85? Right? So we plug that in. We get what? We get 10. Okay. Now, starting with 10, we apply function f and then applied function g. So, if you first apply um, f. Right? Or let's apply g. So function, so f g of x gives you what? 85. And then you plug it into the function again. And what happens? You get 10. 
So you start at 10, and you get right back to 10. So these functions contain inverse operations that quote unquote undo each other, right? So they, they do undo what the previous function did. So if you start at x and you go through a function and then you go through the inverse of its function, you should get right back to x because you basically went in a full circle. So f of 3 equals 29 and g of 29 equals 3. Right? <clears throat> F of negative 5 equals negative 35. G of negative 35 will give you negative 5. So you get back. And you get another one. Okay. In particular, a pair uh, for this pair of functions. Now look at this. We have f of g of 2 equals 2. And g of f of 2 equals 2. Hmm. So in fact, for any value of x, we know that if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence with the function, or if the inverse exists, if we compose both of those functions, the, the given function and its, its um, inverse, then we should be able to get x out of it. So if we take this comp composition, f of g of x, where we're sticking g of x inside f, we should get x back out. Okay, And vice versa, we sh or uh, if we exchange these, we should get the same thing. So g of f of x equals x. And so using the notation for composition of functions, these two equations can be written as follows. f circle g of x equals x and g circle f of x equals x. Okay. Now because the compositions of f and g yield the identity, right? We got, we got y equals x, the identity function, they are inverses of each other. Okay? Now, an inverse function says let f be an, a one to one function, then g is the inverse function of f if f circle g of x gives us x and g circle f of x also yields f. Now, the condition that f is 1 to 1 is the definition of inverse function. Uh, in the definition of inverse function is essential. Otherwise, g will not define a function. Let the functions f and g be defined by f of x equal to x cubed minus 1. And g of x equals the cube root of x plus 1. Is g the inverse of function f? Well, let's find out. Well, one easy way to figure this out is to plug uh, one function into the other. Okay? Now, the horizontal line test applied to the graph indicates that f is a one-to-one -one function. Okay? So the function does have an inverse. Okay, so since it is one to one, we now can find f circle g. Now let functions f and g be defined by f of x equal x cubed minus one, and we'll let g of x equal the cube root of x plus one respectively. Now, is g an inverse of the function? Now, here's where we're going to um, plug it in. So, first we're going to do f circle g of x. So, that means we're take, taking g and we're sticking it inside f. So, we're going to do f of g 
g of x. Now g of x equals this, and f of x equals the outside. Remember, so this is the inside function and the outside function. Okay, so now what we're going to do is let's simplify this. So this cube root, or is this cube is going to be um, canceled by this cube root. So we're going to get x plus 1 minus 1. And then we get x. Okay. So now, let's do it the other way. G circle f of x equals g of f of x. And now we're going to stick f of x inside g of x, and we get this. So now what happens is we're going to simplify this a different way. So we know this is the parentheses we can drop. And we could say this is minus 1 plus 1. So we're going to get the cube root of uh, x cubed. And of course, this cube root and the x cubed undo each other. And we end up with x. And so we just prove that um, g is an inverse function of x. Now, a special notation is used for inverse functions. If g is the inverse of, the, of a function f, then g is written as f inverse. For f of x, x cubed minus 1, f inverse of x is going to be the cube root of the quantity x plus 1. Now, now do not confuse the negative 1 as an exponent, as a negative exponent. It does not mean a negative exponent. The symbol f inverse, or f to the negative 1 power of uh, times x, represents the inverse function, not 1 over the function. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, by definition, the inverse function, the domain of f, is the range of f inverse. And the range of f is the domain of f inverse. So they have opposite, okay, of what you would think. <coughs> Now, to find the inverse of each function, that is 1 to 1. Okay, so here we go. So is this a 1 to 1 function? Mm. Yes, this is a 1 to 1 function. And so we can find the inverse by just flipping the order of each pair. So it would be 1, negative 2, 0, negative 1, 0, 1. 2, 1, 2, 2. For each x value, f corresponds to just one y value. However, the y value, 2, corresponds to two x values. Right. So notice this 2 and this 2 corresponds to these two. Also, the y value in 1 corresponds to negative 2 and 0. So now because at least one y value corresponds to more than one x value, the function, even though it's a function because we showed that it's a function that each x value goes to only one y value, it's not a one-to-one -one function because we don't have the same thing going in the other direction. We don't have uh, only one x value for each uh, y value. Now find the inverse of each function. So, oh, so that was an inverse. So there's, uh, now look at this one. So here's a function. It says 3, let's see, what do we got? We got, yeah, so this is a function. Now let's look at the y values. Okay, do all the y values only go to one x value? And the answer is yes. So this is a one-to-one -one function. And the inverse is just the change or the switch switching of the ordered pairs of the uh, of the two functions. Okay, so three one becomes one three. 
zero two becomes two one and so on and so forth. Okay, so notice how also the domain obviously changes and the range changes for G inverse. Okay. Now let's look at this one. So here we want to find the inverse function that is one to one. Okay, so let's look at the year, year and number of hurricanes. Okay, so now for each year, there is exactly one number of hurricanes. Also for each number of hurricanes, it looks like there's only one year. Okay, so then once we have that, we want to find the inverse. So it says the table shows the number of hurricanes recorded in the North Atlantic during the years 2009 to 2013. It says let f be the function determined in the table, which with the years forming the domain and the numbers, uh, number of hurricanes forming the range. Okay. So now, what are we going to do? So it says, let f be the function. So here we go. The table shows the, the North Atlantic. So 2009 to 2013, let f be the function defined in the table. Okay. Um, with the number of years forming the domain and then the number of hurricanes forming the range. And so now we're going to use these ordered pairs because it does form a function. Okay. So each x value in f corresponds to only one y value in y, and each y value corresponds to only one x value in uh, the domain. So f is a one-to-one -one function. Now the inverse function is found by just interchanging the x y values uh, in the table. So the domain of in the range of f become the range in the domain of f inverse. And so if you just switch, switch them around, right? So before we had 2009 and 3, but now we have 3, 2009, okay? The inverse of a one-to-one -one function is found by interchanging the x and y values of each of its ordered pairs. The, equa the equation of the inverse of a function defined by y equals fx, f of x, is found in the same way. So here's how we do this. It's very straightforward and easy. If we have a one-to-one -one function and we want to find the inverse of the function, algebraically it's very straightforward. So, but if necessary, we have to replace f of x with y first. Okay. Any restrictions on x and y should also be considered. Okay. That can have effect on the domain and range of the resulting composite function. So step one is we're going to take and switch x and y. Then we're going to solve for y and the last step is replace y with inverse of f or f inverse and we're done. So if we want to see this one, so obviously this one has an inverse, it's a straight line. It, there, there is an inverse of this function. And if I wanted to find it then all you would do is follow the steps. Okay, so y equals 2x plus 5, and then what we're going to do is we exchange the x and the y. So we write it as x equal to 2y plus 5. And then once you're done, you solve for y, or excuse me, um, solve for x, or excuse me, solve for y. Okay. And then we get y equals uh, x minus 5 quantity divided by 2. Okay. And so there's our inverse function. And so now we're just going to say we're going to call it f inverse of x. And we can write it as 1 half x, uh, 1 half x minus 5 halves. Okay. In the function defined by f or y equals 2x plus 5, the value of y is found by starting with a value of x, multiplying by 2 and adding 5. The form f of x or f inverse of x equals x plus 5 divided by 2 
for the equation of the universe, or to for the equation of the inverse has us subtract 5 and then divide by 2. This shows how an inverse is used to undo what a function does to x, right? So it's, it's using the opposite functions. So in this case here, we have x squared plus 2. Okay, so this is the equation of parabola that opens up, right? And so some horizontal lines will intersect the graph at two points. For example, both x equals 3 and x equals negative 3 corresponds to y equals 11. Now because of the presence of the x squared term, there are many pairs of x's, uh, there are many pairs of x values that correspond to the same y value. This means that the function considered uh, by y equals x squared plus 2 is not a one-to-one -one function and does not have an inverse. Okay, so now let's look at this one. Okay, so steps for solving, let's see what happens. So we are going to switch x and y, then we're going to solve for y, and there we go. Remember both roots, x squared has to be plus or minus, right? So you took the square root of both sides, and you got plus or minus the square root of x minus 2. And then the last step shows that there are two values of y, two y values, for each choice of x greater than 2. So the given function is not 1 to 1 and cannot have an inverse. Okay. Okay, what about this one? So here we go. Now, by the vertical line test, you know, the horizontal, not the vertical line test, the horizontal line test, we can see that this is a one-to-one -one function. Okay. So this function is one-to-one. -one. So if we start with our function, change it to y and x, and now we're going to switch y and x, and now we're going to have a solve for y equals, or excuse me, x equals, and now what we're going to do is we're going to solve it back. Okay, so we take the cube root of both sides. Okay, and there we go. So f inverse of x equals the cube root of x plus 2. And that will undo f of x equal to x minus 2 quantity squared. Now the rational function has a restricted value here at x equals negative 4. Okay. Now we want it is a rational function. Find its inverse. Okay. So we start with this, and now what are we going to do? We're going to change it to y's and x's. And then what are we going to do? We're going to switch. And now what y is not equal to 4. So now let's solve for y and so we're going to have to multiply both sides by y equals 4 and then we're going to distribute and then collect like terms okay and then we're going to factor out the left side and then divide by that factor and we get y equals 4x plus 3 divided by x minus 2. And, uh, of course, x cannot equal 2. And then we replace y with f inverse of y. Okay. Now, in the final line, we give the condition that x is not equal to 2. 
Note that 2 was not in the range of f. So it is not in the domain of f inverse. Okay? So you got to be careful of that. So one way to graph the inverse of a function is by using the following steps. Step one, find some ordered pairs that are on the graph of f. Step two, interchange x and y to get the ordered pairs that are the ones on the uh, graph of f, of it, uh, f inverse of it. And then three, plot those points and sketch the graph of in, uh, f inverse through them. Okay, so once we do that, then we plot these those points and sketch the graph of f inverse through them. So these are really the only three steps you have to do. So notice this one. So another way is to select points on the graph of f and use the symmetry to find the corresponding points of the inverse because inverse operations are symmetric across the identity function, y equals x. So if you, we know that a comma b is on the graph of f of x, then if we flip across here, then this is has to be a point on the um, inverse of f of x. For example, suppose that point a b shown here is on the graph of a one-to-one -one function uh, f. Then the point b a is also on the graph of F inverse and the line segment connecting a B and B a is perpendicular to and cut in halfway the line uh, y equals X okay the point a B and B a are mirror images of each other with respect to y equals X Now we can find the graph of f inverse from the graph of f by locating the mirror image of each point in f with respect to the identity function y equals x. Now in each set of axes the graph of a one-to-one -one function is, all, is shown in blue. f inverse is shown in red. Now, what we're going to do is on the next slide, the graphs of two functions, f, shown in blue, are given with the inverses shown in red. In each case, the graph of f inverse is a reflection of the graph of f in with respect to uh, the lines y and x. So if you look at here, okay. So if you see here, here's one, right? What happens? Well, we found this point here, and we can find that the corresponding point here is going to be 1, 3. The corresponding point here is across this axis to get to uh, 0, uh, negative 4, 0. Okay. So we can see that both of these are reflecting across the identity function or equation. Now, let's talk about restricted domains. Okay, so let's say that x has to be greater than or equal to negative 5. Why is that? Because we can't have negative numbers under the radical. Okay, so now we want to find the inverse of x, but we have this restriction on here. Okay, so notice that the domain of f of x is negative 5 to infinity okay and the range is what from 0 to infinity okay function f is a one-to-one -one function because it is an increasing function on its entire domain so it's a one-to-one -one function 
and an inverse exists. Now we want to find the equation of the inverse. Okay, so we start with what we know. We got f of x and we've got the domain. Okay. So we're going to replace f of x with y and we get y equals negative x plus 5. And now we switch x and y, just like we did before. And now what we're going to do is we're going to solve for y, right? So now we're going to square both sides to get rid of the uh, radical. And then we're going to subtract 5 from both sides, and we're done. And so we get our inverse. But, however, we cannot define f, of f inverse of x as x squared minus 5 because the domain of f is what? Negative 5 to positive infinity. And its range is 0 to infinity. The range of f is the domain of the inverse. So f inverse must be defined as follows. It must be x squared minus 5. And where x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Why? Because we knew the range of this, or excuse me, not this, uh, the range of the given function f of x, we knew had to be 0 to infinity. Okay. So now if we check, okay, the range of f inverse is negative 5 to infinity. And this domain is the domain of f. Now graph, if we look at graphs of f and inverse are shown below, we can see that they are indeed reflecting across the um, the y equals x identity function. So now the important facts about inverses. So one, if f is one to one, then we know f inverse has to exist. Two, the domain of f is the range of the inverse, and the range of the function is the domain of the inverse. Three, if the point AB lies on the graph of f, then BA lies on the graph of f inverse. The graphs of f and f inverse are reflections of each other across the identity function, y equals x. And then four, to find the equation of f inverse, replace f of x with y, interchange x and y, and then solve for y. And this will give you f inverse of x. So a one-to-one -one function and its inverse can be used to make information secure. The function is used to encode a message, and its inverse is used to decode a uh, the coded message. So now in practice complicated functions are used. So very very complicated functions. So what we're going to do is we're going to use one function, not you know obviously not a complicated function, but use the one to one function 3x plus 1 and the following numerical values assigned to each letter of the alphabet to encode and decode the message be my friend. Okay, so now, so here's what we want to do. So we, here's what we want. We want to decode uh, or encode this message. And we, so we want to basically represent it as um, letters, right? So here's our key that we're going to use to, to decipher the code once we get it. Okay, so now the solution to the message be my friend, Facebook friend, would be encoded this way. So using the code on the previous slide, right here, we've got this list of numerical values, okay? Now because B corresponds to 2, 
and f of 2 equals 7, right? So b is 2, right? So b is 2, and then what we're going to do is plug 2 in here, and it gives us 7. And then e corresponds to 5, but then we're going to stick 5 in here, and that gives us 16, right? and then 40 and so on and so forth. So that's how we encode it. Now, what's next? We're going to use the inverse to decode it, right? So now we're going to use the inverse function. Now we're going to plug each one of these values in here. So if we plug in 7, what are we going to get? We're going to get 7 thirds minus 1 third, which is 2 thirds, which equals 2. And then we're going to use the key to tell us that it corresponds to B. Okay? And so on and so forth. So now, so now, what happens is, we can use the function, right, to take a key, right, with a key, to take any letter or any message, transform it into a code, and then if the person we give the code to has the inverse function, right, they're able to use the key and the inverse function to decode the message. And so that's one uh, use of this. Okay. So that ends this section, and next time we're going to start section uh, 2 of chapter 4. Until then, keep practicing, bring me your questions, and uh, or anything you get stuck on, we'll work it out in class. Have a great day.